So antigenic shifting is when there's a major mutagenic shift, which is a genetic reassortment of particles, okay? And we'll talk about that. Um, it's a little confusing, but not much. Um, I think I can explain it in a way that everybody can understand, and this is, this is how. So birds get it. I, I got a duck here because a duck's kind of halfway in between domesticated poultry and, and flying fowl. So if a duck gets the um, H5N1, it has 16 hemagglutinins and 9 miramidases. Mm -hmm. And it's flying around and it's putting its droppings everywhere. And other chickens and birds are getting it. And it lands in the yard. The virus then can either infect the family directly or the virus can infect the pig. So we now know that this virus jumps between birds and pigs, okay? If it infects the pig, the pig can get pretty sick. Interestingly, the pig can get our virus, our regular virus that we get every year, the pig can get, hence the swine flu. And if you were a pig farmer, you'd probably know pig farmers have to worry about this and they have to, vac they have to be concerned that they might lose their whole population of pigs from influenza. Just like we get sick and our, you know, we don't have enough nurses or doctors to do cases or whatever, that same thing happens in pigs. And they're not supposed to sell them when this happens and that's what happened in Mexico is a large population of pigs got infected. And that's why at the beginning of this current pandemic, we heard, oh, well, don't eat pig. Because in Mexico, they were telling the people, don't eat the pig. Because the pig actually had, excuse me, the pig actually had the virus. And if you ate undercooked pork, you could get it. So you can imagine if our H1N1 went into the pig and the H5N1 went into the pig, and then these two little particles started to reassort because viruses replicate very rapidly. We're talking hours. And they create a new virus particle. This new virus particle will have some characteristics that we've seen before as humans, but it will also have characteristics that we've never seen before, like the highly pathogenic H5N1 that that duck had. And that's what happens, and that's how the kill rate goes up. And that's why this fall, we're looking at the kill rate. So people say, okay, well, not very many people die from H1N1 that we just got, so why should I worry? Why should I protect myself? Why should I protect my patients? Why should I protect my family from me when I come home? This is why. Because we now know that this virus we all got, and we have some patients in the ICU with, this is what month? This is July. We're not even supposed to have influenza yet. So that is why. In the fall, when this comes back around, as it travels the globe, it's going to have a different antigenic structure than it did when it came out first, and we know that's going to be a highly pathogenic structure. So um, this slide is a bit complicated, but it shows the same thing in color, which that's why I kept it up here. So you can see all the green is the little uh, RNA viral uh, components, the genes, okay? Those two, the H2N1 and the H1N1, Combined, and that's what created Asian influenza in 1957, we talked about just a minute ago. And they combined and created a new particle. This particle is now out there. In 1968, it combined with avi an avian virus from a chicken, and it made a new virus. This virus infected humans as the Hong Kong flu. The next pandemic could be this virus that's still out there from 1968. It's still out there and being spread amongst us as humans could combine with a totally new avian influenza, the H5N1, or it could combine with the H1N1, which came from a previous outbreak, this one. Okay, the Spanish flu, 1918 pandemic that I showed you all the dead bodies. That's what this current H1N1 is. It's from this genome. And we know that for 100% sure. A guy took the virus from the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology a few years ago, and he actually got a big award for identifying the viral structure, the, geno the genome structure of the virus. He took a piece of frozen virus that they had at AFIP and identified the gene sequence. So now we know that gene sequence, and now we know the current H1N1 has that gene sequence in it. So that's why we know it's going to be a pandemic. And that's why the WHO declared it a pandemic now. This shows you the timeline of the viruses. What's important here, I'll just stress, is 
1915, we didn't have airplanes. None of us could fly. Now, in the 60s, we all started flying as kids. Now we all fly for business. Look what happened to influenza. Because we fly around, we go to Asia, we get it, we bring it back here, then we give it to our family, and they go to school, and they give it to all the kids at school. We've created a huge amount of genetic reassortment of influenza that's happening very rapidly. And that's what's causing a huge impact on the human global population is air travel. So we're worried because the potential impact is catastrophic. Pandemic is the worst case public health scenario that we will ever imagine. There's six billion people on earth in 1918. We didn't even have half that. We didn't have a third of that. We had less than a fifth of that. For perspective, the anthrax attack that we all freaked out about caused less than 10 deaths. The Twin Towers, less than 3,000. I know that's a lot of people, but this is just perspective. Natural disasters such as hurricanes and tornadoes cause hundreds of thousands of deaths. We saw that with Katrina. And the tsunami, which was the worst case natural disaster we've ever had, caused only, only 300,000 deaths. We're talking about hundreds of millions of people dying in the world. And everybody's just sitting around. And I don't understand it, I'll be honest with you. And that's why I'm really pleased to be here. Um, this is what was sent to Tom Brokaw. It's just kind of interesting. We all are very familiar with this image. And we know how it impacted us. It impacted us emotionally, it impacted us physically. Many of us felt sick to our stomach. Many of us didn't want to come to work. Many of us were frightened for years after that we were gonna be the next uh, terrorist uh, uh, target. Uh, and we've all prepared for terrorism in many ways, but we haven't prepared for pandemic influenza. This is uh, something I wanted to show you. This is Korea. There was an oil spill and the people of Korea are very, very compassionate people. It amazed me when I visited there. And all the people went out to the beach, just like we do here in San Francisco. When we had that horrible oil spill, what was that, a couple years ago, we all went out and collected birds and tried to clean the birds off. Well, guess what? These birds carry H5N1. And this man has, I think he's got gloves on only. He has no face mask on because he, he didn't know and no one told him. Here are people going from South Korea to North Korea. And we know in North Korea they're trying to, you know, drop a bomb on somebody. Maybe they'll drop it on themselves, unfortunately, uh, and maybe that'll stop him killing us or other people in the world. But the South Koreans went up to North Korea to help. And here we are, an earthquake. All the debris, all the dust, we're not wearing anything to protect ourselves. It's human nature. We don't. We think it looks silly. So 9-11 caused us to change our focus from bioterrorism, which we had it on because of the anthrax, to terrorism. SARS, I'm sure there's some people in this audience that are old enough to remember SARS, infected 8,000 people that we know of and killed 800. That's a 10% kill rate. We're talking about a 50% kill rate. By the way, it affected 27 countries, SARS did, and many of those countries couldn't report completely. And the other thing you should know as healthcare professionals is that many nurses and one doctor died from SARS. They were taking care of the patient that came from Hong Kong, the incident case. Um, they didn't get it. The next wave that came through six weeks later, uh, two of the nurses were in the room when the doctor intubated the patient. The doctor and the nurses died. And a lot of people in this country don't know that. They were wearing masks, okay? So um, this is from Michael Levitt. He's a Health and Human Services Secretary, <clears throat> and everybody can read it. I, I think that this is from 2006, and he said, it does not mean that a pandemic is at our doorstep. Well, it does mean that a pandemic is at our doorstep. Why he said that is because he had to be worried that he was going to scare everybody, just like we saw our vice president say, oh, I'm not getting on an airplane. And then the very next day, everybody said, oh, my God, you can't say that. The economy's a mess. Don't say that. And what happened? Airline travel decreased, and he had to get on the news and, and apologize. Well, he said that because his staff was telling him, don't get on an airplane because that's how it's going to get transmitted. The first impact is going to be from flying. We know the woman who got it in Hong Kong, the Canadian who got it from the doctor in Hong Kong that had it, she was in the hotel with the doctor. That's how she got it. They were on the same floor. She got on an airplane, flew to Canada,